Hi, Donna. Hi, Al. Good to see you. Good to see you, too. <laughs> so we're going to talk about um, categories today, categories of experience, how our minds and our brains categorize our experience to make sense out of the world. You know, we've talked before about Dr. Feldenkrais's way to, in a way, it's naming categories, that our thoughts, our sensations, our feelings, and our actions. So those are really broad categories, and they help us make distinctions and differentiate our behavior and even how our brains work. So today, I think we're going to talk a little bit more specifically about how our brain makes a prediction according to the categories that we've formed over our lifespan until this moment. So we can start out with talking about what is a category, what, what would be like a really basic category that we could talk about, something that everybody's already got familiarity with? Mm -hmm. I think everybody has a category of red. Indeed, mm -hmm. I do. What comes up for you in your category of red? Well, immediately my red truck popped into my head. Mm-hmm. Uh, Apple. Mm hmm. And finally, I was priming a wall today and I took off the cover plate and I could see under the layer of dark brown paint a really deep red. Curiously, that popped into my head too. Mm -hmm. That fits into the category of red. Yeah, great. So, if what happened for me was red apple, red rose, and then I stopped there. And I think I could keep going, but those are two very immediate reds for me. And I'm sure people listening at home probably had, or in the car, wherever they are, probably had all kinds of red things popping in their heads. In fact, yeah. you can't not think of things that belong in a category like that. Mm -hmm. You could name lots of categories like that. They're really concrete and familiar and examples are just going to pop up. Yeah. It's immediate. You cannot not do that. Yeah. Another one is dog. Oh, God, I love dogs. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> so I think of my dog. He's a white golden retriever. His name is Happy. And so I immediately think of Happy, Happy Dog. I think of my dog, Oz. I have a picture of him right here next to my computer. And, of course, my dog, Fred, at home. And last dog we had, Lily. She passed away a couple of years ago. She was a real sweetheart. We've had a lot of dogs. They're all kind of like in the background. You know, I can see them all. Mm -hmm. So it's very fun to, to think about. Yeah, it is. I feel love and appreciation for all the dogs that have been a part of our family and my neighbor's dog, too. I'm very fond of Osa. So dog is a lovely category in my mind. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I thought it was interesting what you were talking about early on. But just when we started, you talked about the categories of experience, the way Dr. Feldenkrais chunked them down. So, you know, sensing, thinking, moving, and feeling. That's really mm -hmm. broad categories. Mm -hmm. Pretty abstract. So I don't know what our listeners think about when they hear the word sensing. Mm -hmm. What comes to mind? And what comes what, to mind for you? Awareness through movement experiences come to my mind. Every time I do an awareness through movement lesson, a Feldenkrais lesson, I feel so good. And I imagine myself immediately lying on the floor and feeling the support of the floor, the ground, and how there's this transition into deeper and deeper resting. And with that comes a sense of pleasure in the letting go. And then the movements begin. And then there's always some kind of surprise even though I've done some lessons hundreds of times, but it's a new day, it's a new time, I'm in a different state. And so I find something new and different. And there's something so incredibly pleasurable about that. So when I said sensing, I started to think about the context of awareness through movement too. Mm -hmm. I was thinking about the eyes and the vision. So I immediately had a memory of doing a standing lesson, turning using the eyes as an organizing principle and working with that whole visual field with that lesson mm -hmm. and then taking that down into more of the movement sensations, the proprioception, the mm -hmm. sense of my skeleton, that kind of thing. Yeah. So, so let's I'll, have our listeners experience that a little bit. Yeah. So that sense of 
standing, sitting, doing whatever you're doing, pause for a moment if it's possible, and simply move your eyes to the left and back to the middle, just gently, just to the left and back to the middle. And do that a number of times. And while you do that, notice your breathing and sense your head. Is your head turning with your eyes or are you just moving your eyes? Now, probably your head's turning a little bit too. And if you're preventing it from moving, then then you're doing something unique. You're actually stopping your head turning and you're moving your eyes. That's a highly differentiated movement. We seldom do that. So now let your head turn with your eyes. And see whatever it is over to your left side and come back to the middle. And now notice your breathing. And as you turn your head and your eyes to the left, does your right shoulder come forward? Does your left shoulder move back? So now we're starting to include more in the movement of looking to the left. Now, the next time you come back to the middle, just move your eyes to the left and notice what happens. What's the quality of movement like for you? And while resting, notice, do you see more to your left than to your right? Has your peripheral vision to the left grown compared to the right side vision? Yes, you're saying thumbs up. Yes, it has. And I actually was playing with the movements too while speaking, and I've got this big view to the left. The right is not as enhanced. Yeah, I probably got another 10 degrees to the left, more than Uh to the right. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. Yeah, so that was just maybe 45 seconds. Yeah. And we created a sensory difference. And other kinds of sensory experiences, when we mentioned that, people might think about being out in nature or eating a good meal, mm-hmm. sipping some tea or coffee, mm-hmm. having a nice glass of wine, you know, mm-hmm. something that that is you know, really satisfying in, the, in a sensory kind of way. So there's all kinds of ways that people can have categorized their sensory experience and hear that. Because you know, mm-hmm. we're talking about Christ practitioners, so we... We go right for that deep, rich, sensory experience that is awareness through movement. Yes. Yes. So we have a very well-developed category for sensations, and we have a very well-developed category for awareness through movement that includes pleasurable sensation. Yeah. And in fact, I would like to invite our audience to take advantage of some of our lessons because It's an extraordinary category to develop that lends itself to pleasure, wellness, overcoming difficulties. It's this category that we rely on, those of us that have been practicing the Feldenkrais Method for years, and even some of my students that are in a class weekly for a short period of time are doing that too, very immediately. They're developing this new category of go-to for wellness of all kinds. Interesting thing. You're talking about students and uh, new students coming in and starting to experience this work. And one of the things I think is really interesting, I hear this from from people when they're starting to do lessons and guiding their attention, then they'll wonder, am I really feeling that? Is that a real sensation or am I just making that up? And I tell them, well, if you're feeling it, it's real. You know, what comes to mind for me is the first time I felt my hip joints moving. It was a long time ago, but I remember it to this day so distinctly. And just remembering it, I can sense my hip joints as I'm sitting here and speaking with you. And that's one of those times for people that they question. It's like, is it possible to really sense the movement in your hip joints? And I know for a fact it's possible because I've done it and I do it, but it's not available for most people that I've met unless they've done awareness through movement. That's something you really have to learn to sense, to learn Mm -hmm. to experience. And when you do that, then you start to form a category around it. It starts to fit into a category. Maybe it's a new category, Mm -hmm. or maybe it fits into some previous category you already had. 
Uh, right. Hopefully you build a new category. Mm-hmm. And you know, I know I've built a lot of new categories about myself in this work, doing this practice. Mm-hmm. And kind of along the same lines with your experience, I remember the first time I felt myself from the bottom of my feet to the top of my head, fully and completely. And I was washing dishes, and I just had this sense of feeling myself from my feet to the top of my head, which I'd never felt before. It was Mm -hmm. a totally new experience to feel myself wholly like that. Of course, this was, you know, a couple of decades ago. Mm -hmm. And there was a, it was a new experience. And I think I probably formed a new category of experience based on that one event. Mm -hmm. And in that, I started to seek that out. I started to have the ability to find more examples like that. Which is another kind of interesting way to think about categories. So in terms of a strategy for learning, when I was going through my training, it's like there's concepts that we are presented with in the training, like the Weber-Fechner principle. You know, using less effort, you can sense more. Mm-hmm. And so I didn't have examples of that going into the training. Mm-hmm. It was presented as a concept. I accepted the concept as truth. And I made a category for it. It was an empty category. And then I started looking for examples of it. And so by doing it and practicing it, I started to find the examples that validated the the concept and began to flesh out the the category. Mm -hmm. So now that's a category of experience based on a concept that I created. So building categories like that can be really useful in terms of learning, too. Yeah, so let's give some examples of that. So if you put a book on the top of your head, you're going to feel it. If a fly lands on the top of your head, you may or may not feel it. If you feel that fly, then you've had to increase your sensory awareness. So you have to become more sensitive to sense something so minute, but it's possible. And we know through practice that we're able to sense very minor stimulants like that. The variables can be less and less. Yeah, I guess another one that comes to mind is if you have a lit room and you light a candle, you don't see that much light. But if you have a dark room and you you light a candle, you're going to have a tremendous illumination. So it's this juxtaposition, and that would be a visual sensory experience. The other one where is more of a physical kinesthetic sensory experience. You know, music is like that too. If it's a very quiet setting and you hear just a note on a piano played, wow, it's so loud. But if you're in a really noisy environment, you know, lots of traffic or kids yelling and screaming and playing outside and stuff, you hit a note on a piano, it's like, "Eh, that's the note on the piano, but it doesn't have this full experience. So now, you know, we have a Weber-Fechner category, and probably most people don't, and they haven't ever heard the term, (laughs) but it's developing for those of you that are listening. And it's important if you want to make distinctions. It is. It is really important, and it's a really key concept that we use in teaching awareness and movement and functional integration. It just simply states that there's a ratio between how much effort you put into something and how much you can sense. If you reduce Mm -hmm. the effort, your ability to sense increases, it goes Mm -hmm. up. And the more effort you put into something, then your ability to sense decreases. And that's true in all sensory systems. Yeah. So creativity as a category, it's kind of big. It's a big umbrella, let's say. And we don't know what people come up with when you say, what's in your category of creativity? <laughs> I, I think probably most people go like, I have a category of creativity. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's so much fun. There's so much pleasure in creativity. Yeah. So putting words together in a poem, that's very creative. It's, I think of creativity from that point of view, actually, is that you're combining things in a way that have never been combined before. Yeah. So the movements that we teach in awareness through movement are movements that have never been combined before for most people. It's a very creative process of actually teaching awareness through movement and doing it. Yeah. Uh-huh. When well, you're a painter too, a painter and is an, an artist painter. Mm-hmm. And so that's an example of creativity for you personally, isn't it? 
It is. And many people, when they think of painting or all kinds of things, they go, well, it's been done before. I mean, there's this category of abstract expressionism. And there are a million of us out there painting. But what I've seen, and I sometimes, you know, take workshops or I paint with amongst a group of friends, we all create vastly different paintings. We couldn't possibly do the same paintings. And we have our own styles. And they emerge. There's a creative style emerging for everyone. It's fascinating to observe. And it comes from the way that you put color together, you use different paintbrushes, different strokes. I mean, it's just so much fun. And by seeing it like that, it kind of removes the onus of whether I'm good or not. Because the goodness is whether or not people like looking at it. That's all. So it's interesting what you said. So you're an artist, you're a painter, mm-hmm. and you work with a collective of people. And you said, mm-hmm. what, what are you, the category Abs- of? Abstract expressionism. So the category of painting you do is abstract expressionism. Yes. And then within that category, I mean, there's lots of people doing that, right? Mm-hmm. But then, then each one of you has your own way of expressing yourself mm-hmm. in that category of abstract expressionism. Yes. There's like all these little subcategories in a way yeah. of each person's way that they go about expressing themselves. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yesterday I had a friend here. She was helping me do some things in the house, move the, move some things around, just, you know, helping out. And um, she said, I couldn't help but look at your paintings. You know, she hasn't been over for quite a while. And she said, every painting that I look at is so full of joy and vitality. She said, you must be a very happy woman. <laughs> and I said, wow, thank you. That, you know, that made my day. Because that's the reason I paint. I want to create beautiful things that people can look at over time and still find them beautiful and even surprising. So that was an unsolicited comment that was very, very lovely. That's nice. That's Mm -hmm. really nice. Another thing that, well, we were talking about this before we started the podcast, is the experience, really raw sensory experience that Mm -hmm. is uncategorized. And so I gave an example of my aging eyes in dark light and looking at something and not being able to tell what it is. And so I can see an object and the light is dim and I just get into this state of like, I have no idea what that is. I'm become totally curious about it. And I'm really enjoying that state of not knowing and kind of being in that kind of a floaty abstract experience. And then, you know, I can get it close enough to it. And I go, oh, well, that's that, that kind of thing. I share the example about my friend, Steve Andreas. Mm -hmm. He'd cut down a tree in his backyard and he saw these blue glowing things in the lawn. He didn't know what they were. And he's scratching his head and being curious about it. And his mind starts to go to all kinds of you know, ways of trying to figure that out. You know, what could this be? Maybe they're alien things. We don't really know. And you got it close enough to the robin's eggs in the grass. But then, you know, the mind and the brain, they just search, trying to find what is the category that this thing fits into? It's really kind of a really cool state to be in. And I mean, I find this state in myself doing awareness through movement. I know a lot of new students, when they start doing the Feldenkrais method, functional integration or awareness of the movement also get into this state. They'll start sensing something, feeling something, or becoming aware of something. And there's almost a sense of disbelief that they're actually feeling that or Mm -hmm. sensing it because they don't have a category for that. Yeah. And so the overarching category that comes up in my mind is uh, moving into the unknown. It's like, being willing in a way or open or just recognizing after the fact that you don't know what's going on or you don't know what's going to happen. You open a process and you don't know the end result. And, you know, that could have to do with buying a house or getting a car or looking for a new shirt. It's like you open the process and then you have to go into a search mode or a new pair of shoes or even a, a tree that, or a bush that you want to put in the garden. You don't know in advance what you want. You have to gather some information first. And that is really fun. 
you know, mm-hmm. to be searching for something. Yeah. And then eventually you obtain whatever it is. And then you get to wear your new shoes and you get to marvel at them and feel the comfort of them, hopefully, <laughs> you know, or watch your new bush sprout and have new flowers. And it's like, so there's an open ended process of unknown. And I really enjoy having that category and realizing that it exists because now that I have it, I can create it again and again and really enjoy the process. Yeah. I think it's a really, I love the state myself. I think it's a really fun and interesting state to get into. Mm -hmm. It's like uh, kind of a very pleasant floating kind of sensation for me, which is like, uh, liberating. It's pleasant. It's not mm-hmm. one that has words attached to it, mm-hmm. you know, for me. It's kind of a raw sensory experience. And it's mm-hmm. uh, it's also kind of a, as we're having this discussion, I'm realizing that there could be what we call reframing involved in some situations because buying a new pair of shoes is not always pleasant for people. They bought a lot of shoes that don't fit their feet or they're uncomfortable or they might have a pain in their feet. So they're searching for the best shoe. And so as they approach that, it could be actually stressful, uncomfortable, but it's possible to shift our state by recognizing what's going on in the brain Because the prediction is it's going to be difficult to find a good pair of shoes that really match my feet and make me comfortable. Well, what if you just say, I don't know what I'm going to find, and I'm looking forward to searching and trying on shoes until I find the pair that fits me the best? It's like you tell the story differently in advance. Well, you know, that reminds me of a Feldenkrais lesson. (laughs) so? It does. You're doing a series of movements. For example, the thing we did earlier in the podcast where you had mm-hmm. us look to the left and turn to the left. So mm-hmm. each one of those is like trying a different way of turning to the left with just mm-hmm. the eyes, with the head, the shoulders. And you can try all these different ways of turning to the left. And none of them are failures or successes. They're all just examples of turning to the left. Mm-hmm. And then when you come back to just turning the eyes to the left, something miraculous changes. Mm-hmm. So when I talk to people about trying different ways of doing things, it is kind of like trying on a pair of shoes or you just try them on and, no, this one doesn't work. These don't work. This one feels really good. I like these <laughs> shoes. Mm-hmm. You know, so you find a way of doing it that is really comfortable and satisfying to you. And that's kind of like a Felder Christ lesson. That's really true. And as you were speaking, I was going, yeah, nice, comfortable pair of shoes. And I took a breath. It's like, yeah. And I have my favorite shoes and I have a pair on right now that fit my feet perfectly. And I love them. And actually, I have several pairs of them because they fit my feet so well. (laughs) And the other thing that happened while I was listening to you is that I really wanted to look to the right. (laughs) So how about we look to the right with our eyes and come back to the middle and notice your breathing. And as you look to the right with your eyes, notice your head. Is it moving too? Are you holding it still? And maybe you could do it both ways. Move your head and your eyes to the right. And then just move your eyes to the right and back to the middle. And now imagine looking to the right and move your left shoulder forward and see what happens. Your left shoulder is coming forward and maybe your right shoulder is going back. And observe your head and your eyes. Notice your breathing. And then let everything move. Look to the right and sense yourself moving. Notice your breathing. And come back to the middle and look to the left and let everything move easily to the left. Slowly go through the middle and look to the right. And do that one more time. Slowly look to the left and make sure your eyes are seeing as you look to the left and your eyes are seeing as you look to the right. Come back to the middle and notice yourself. Sense your peripheral vision. Notice how you're seeing, your breathing, the length of your spine. 
And I wonder if you're sensing yourself a little bit differently now and your relationship to the space around you. Sounds very interesting. Now, standing here, I have a much greater sense, even though I can't see the room behind me, Mm -hmm. greater sense of the room behind me, Mm. greater sense of the dimensionality. So not only is my peripheral vision expanded, but my sense of what's going on behind me. The turning expanded in such a way that I could turn and I could see all the way around behind myself. And so now that's part of my sense right now. Well, you know, I'm very interested in how the brain works as you are and how we form these categories and what, what's already in the category and how we can manipulate our own brain mind to change the categories up and make different kinds of predictions. So I wonder if you, those of you that are listening, would be willing to send us some questions about this or awareness of the categories that you have going on and how that stacks up for you. They can leave a comment on the website or comment on the Apple podcast too. So leave us a comment, send us an email. Love to hear your thoughts and reactions to these ideas. And you can find lessons on my website at DonnaRay.com. We have little snippets of movement experiences in our podcasts. And you can also go to Achieving Excellence, Al's website, and find a variety of lessons there. And look for our workshops so that you could come and hang out with us for three hours or so and experience some awareness or movement lessons with us. Yeah, it's good stuff. Thank you. All right. Bye. Bye.